Welcome to another edition of Around with Randall, your weekly podcast on making your nonprofit more effective for your community. And here is your host, the CEO and founder of Hallett Philanthropy, Randall Hallett. It's an honor to have you join me, Randall, on this edition of Around with Randall. In today's 20-minute conversation, my 21st century classroom, we want to talk about advisory groups and why they might be important to you and how to use them effectively. And in the end, what everyone seems to get out of them when they're done correctly. This all stems from a conversation that I'm having with a current client who's looking at a fairly large, what I'll call strategic project. It's not a campaign, but there's a couple things in a related area that they need and they're more complicated. It isn't as if a, the complete understanding of what this could mean resides within the nonprofit. And part of what we've talked about is how do we get others involved, really creating an advisory group. You might parallel this to kind of a campaign committee uh, in a such, and, and I'm not even talking about the structure where that I tend to do with uh, when I do feasibility studies and or more importantly, campaign counsel with clients building out a volunteer structure, chairs. I'm just talking about a group of people that can help foster maybe some insight as to what needs to be done. The challenge has been in this particular case is that as the advancement development slash foundational office has put this group together based on the conversations I'm having with them, the organizational executive leadership has pushed back on this a little bit because this group has come with some opinions. There are some experts and that's changed the plans potentially a little bit and maybe the costs and things of that nature. And the executive leadership is not all that excited about having some of this input, which is, has led me to what is it that we should do to make sure both the organization and the people, maybe your advisory group, get value out of this conversation, get value out of this relationship. One of the best advisory groups, and I think this also formulates that the formality of such a group isn't necessary. This isn't a minute-keeping entity, i.e. we got to keep minutes, you know, what everyone says, like a board meeting, was when I was at the University of Nebraska. The chancellor of the university was incredibly effective at having what he called his kitchen cabinet. He would meet with these eight to 10, 11 people who were incredibly influential on a fairly regular basis. There was no formal mention of the group. They weren't really listed anywhere. They uh, certainly did not heighten their community awareness of the group, both individually and collectively, but they provided the chancellor with an incredible sounding board with some of the things that he wanted to accomplish and would also be able to inform him maybe what the community thought about these things, give him some level of insight as to what his thoughts were on the university side of the academic medical center. This I thought was incredibly effective when we moved into the $500 million campaign because we weren't walking into unknown space based on the fact that between the hospital board, which was, maybe a kind of formalized advisory group for the CEO uh, of the hospital, of the medical center, and the kitchen cabinet, which had one or two kind of overlaps. The community was more prepared for this. Highly effective, but highly unofficial. Advisory groups are ways that if you're willing to listen, you can bring people to the table that can better help you. So I want to break this into two parts. The first is the bigger picture of what are the benefits of creating an advisory group for both the organization and the individuals who might be willing to, quote unquote, air quote, serve. And then the tactical is what are the necessary elements to this that actually make it successful? So let's start real quickly talking about the benefits. Uh, Part of this is also a conversation around who do you ask? So 
as we go through the benefits, I want to really highlight maybe some thoughts as to who might be a member of this group. The first thing is, is that you're looking for, from the nonprofit side, from the organizational side, expertise. One of the things you're looking for. The particular uh, client conversation that I started with, this was a, a more technical need that the organization had. This wasn't something simple that you know everybody probably could figure out. It was more based upon the needs of a very tactical, tactical area. What's interesting about that is, is that they were able to harness a couple of really experienced people in this area, and that caused some of these changes. But that also elevated the quote-unquote case for the need. It turned out that the people inside the organization who were are going to be great at utilizing this particular area weren't at the cutting edge of what for-profit business were doing in this area. And so when you brought in those experts, they said, no, well, if you think about it just a little bit differently or change this piece of equipment or change what you're thinking about in terms of outcome, what you get is a much deeper, more, more robust opportunity to really build the nonprofit's reputation in the area. So finding experts is important. So for an education, you probably want people that, if you're at the law school, that have a legal understanding. Or if you're in science, they have a science experience or, or knowledge or wisdom. If you're in healthcare, maybe they were a grateful patient or family who've gone through the process of whatever that particular service area is. If you're a food and or, and or shelter nonprofit, you're talking to people who are at the front lines of serving these communities. Or maybe you need, if you're shelter building, how do you build certain things? Expertise is important because what it does is it gives you a kind of a, a reservoir of knowledge and wisdom that you may not have. So expertise is number one. Number two is, is that the benefit is, is it increases credibility. If you're able to, whether quietly uh, or maybe more officially, have some type of recognition of the group, even if it's just unofficially saying, you know, well, we've got these three people who are kind of guiding us. If you have the right three people when you have the initial conversations that philanthropy might be a part of this discussion, that enhances the overall credibility of the overall project. Hey, my gosh, they're thinking about this from a more holistic perspective, a deeper perspective, a more technologically advanced perspective. So you elevate that credibility. Number three is you provide strategic guidance about kind of seeing things through a new lens, a fresh perspective. Not to parallel my uh, great joy in uh, Nebraska finally making a bowl game, but in the middle of the season, the f head coach made the decision to bring in an offensive, new offensive coordinator who wasn't there every day. And all of a sudden, new players started to play. There was a different way they looked at their offense. Sometimes a new perspective can give you a, a an elevated perspective an enhanced view of what you're trying to accomplish because we tend to get into ruts. We tend to see the same thing over and over again. By having an outside group, they may provide some useful enlightenment into what might be possible or what you might be missing, but you didn't know. Number four is it expands your network. Who doesn't want a nonprofit who has more people that believe in what they're doing? This comes back to my old all-time favorite adage inside of what we do in the world of philanthropy and fundraising. Ask somebody for money, you get advice. Ask their advice, you may get their money. Think about a small group of people who are advising you about what to do. You're not even asking them for money. You're asking them for their expertise, their beliefs, their, their know-how. That leads potentially, not maybe just for them, but those around them, maybe some for some philanthropic conversations down the road. If nothing else, it may get them talking in the community about your organization to people that don't know that much about you. The last is, is as I talked about the resource development, and this is kind of a subset of four, but I've just learned 
that old adage that I mentioned a few minutes ago about asking for advice and getting money, asking for money, you get advice. I cannot tell you how important that is. When you have people on the inside who are willing to give you advice, to advocate, to connect, they are just simply more willing and likely to give you money because you've bought into their emotional perspective. I think the opposite is also true. We tend to not be very good at, you've heard me say this on a million different podcasts or the trainings I do, blessing and releasing. We tend to think, well, I'm just going to keep going at these particular opportunities because they, they got money and they're going to give to me. Well, we know money actually at the highest levels comes from emotional connection, content, to, to, the, the ability for them to see themselves as a part of the solution. If you don't have that, then why are we keeping that, op, that, that motion of spinning our wheels a part of the process? Sometimes releasing people because they don't have any interest, either advice or not, is a healthy thing. From the nonprofit side, there are four things that are incredibly beneficial. Number one is really about this idea of impactful engagement. You are, or from, excuse me, from the donor and philanthropy's perspective, when you ask someone what they believe, what their opinions are, you elevate their connection to you in the organization. This can be done on a personal level. Sometimes, even if you think you know the answer, it's incredibly powerful to go, let's say, to your team or to someone else and say, here's my situation. Love your advice. That elevates, deepens the relationship, which may mean more philanthropy. It may not. But what it does mean is, is that you are buy, getting them to buy into what they believe, and they're doing it through the thing you're trying to do. Number two is connection to the mission. I think sometimes we don't understand that sometimes more often than not, I'll put it that way. We need more people out there advocating for what we're doing, even if they're not our largest funders. The more people we have telling our story, the better off we are from a community wide branding perspective, from a awareness perspective from a connection to what we do and why it's a problem perspective, I think sometimes we underestimate how important it is to have advocates running around all over the place talking about what value we bring in philanthropy in particular for your nonprofit. That comes as a benefit because if they believe in you, they'll talk about it to other people. The third is for the philanthropist slash donor slash advisor slash uh, sage of, of a particular area you're looking for is it brings networking opportunities. They get an opportunity if, if, if we do this correctly for a small group to be networking with other people, either in their area of expertise, maybe their area of influence, higher level people. They, people like that. People want to know what others are doing. And in particular, they have the opportunity to kind of know what's the bigger picture and opportunity to chat about what might be possible, not about you, what you're doing, but in their life, in their career. You do that through networking. The last thing is, is it kind of leans into the idea of influence. People, and we think about our donors, philanthropists, our uh, sages of wisdom and knowledge of what we're trying to do, people like to feel like they have a part in something. They want to be a part of something. Gerald Panis did a study of the largest donors. Uh, Mega Gifts was the name of the study in the book decades ago. But this was one of the outcomes that I think people are always surprised by or maybe just forget. is People want to feel like they have influence on positive things, that they are a part of something bigger, that it makes a difference. Think about a room full, and maybe that's only three or four or five people, of individuals who feel like when I show up here, people are listening to me and I'm making a difference on what they're doing to make the world or the community a better place. How powerful is that? Maybe a subset of that is also recognition. Maybe it's just personal recognition. Maybe it's that holiday gift that the, I think about what the chancellor would do so well, taking a holiday gift to their front door, to their office door and say, want personally, 
I want to thank you for the six, eight, 10 conversations we've had with others like you that have helped me strategically move the organization, the university forward. That is incredibly powerful, even though no one else knows about it. So these are the benefits. How do we do this in an effective way? Well, there's two things that we have to make sure we always remember that are the guiding principles, one for the organization, one for the members of the group, however you want to call them. I'm going to start with the nonprofit. If you and or the people you are working with who are a part of this, if you're an enormous academic medical center, that may be department chairs or division chairs or division leaders. In a smaller nonprofit, it may be the CEO, maybe a board member or two. But from the organizational perspective, the elements that are necessary for success start with one simple premise. You have to be willing to listen to them. Doing this with only the purpose being well, we're going to make better connections, go ask them for money, will kill you if you aren't willing to actually listen to their expertise in their opinions. I always talk about it from the standpoint in philanthropy with a content expert that I, when we get into a fundraising, maybe individual donor opportunity conversation outside of this, they only want to take, or we should only take 50% of whatever it is we want to do. And we should ask the potential donor, what do you think about this? What's missing? What could we do? It doesn't mean you have to take all of their advice. But if you call a group of people together and you ask them, well, what is it you think that we could do to make this better? And then basically blow them off. You will never get them in the room again. And where I started this entire discussion was around that story with the client. And it wasn't that the executive leadership, the administrative leadership ignored them, but they certainly didn't make them feel important as to their expertise. And now advancement's got a problem because they are, they can't get people to come back to additional conversations and meetings because the comment has been, well, I give you my advice and basically you don't want it. If the organization isn't willing to embrace what they're actually saying, then don't do this. It will benefit no one. It won't benefit you. It won't benefit them. So you need to realize you have to be listening. Number two, you have to give kind of the sub points, a clear purpose. A, you have to be strategic in who you bring in. These should be people that elevate discussions, not just, hey, we're going to have a cup of coffee together. It should be regular if done correctly. And regular doesn't mean forever. If the project needs six months of attention, then their role is six months long. Now, they might be able to do something else down the road. But if you don't have clear roles and clear selection and clear regular communication and connection, this is not meant to be a one-time shot. You should do several of these discussions. So people feel like they can learn about it, know about it, and build into it. It should also be staff supported. So when I think about the work that the chancellor did, as well as the CEO did with his board, which was more like that than not, because it was such a small group, there was staff in the room. The CEO and the chancellor weren't doing the heavy lifting. I was. I didn't have anything to say, but if someone said, well, we want to follow up on that, I knew my job was to make sure it got done. You have to have people supporting this in a larger way so that the work is being done, not by the volunteers, although they provide their expertise, but by the organization at the proper level. For members, what is it that you need to make sure that there's effectiveness on their point or on their side or on their from their perspective? Number two, number one, excuse me, overall overreaching, much like you have to be willing to listen if you're the nonprofit, you have to make it valuable, a value driven engagement. If you don't elevate to higher levels of discussion, engagement, involvement, getting and garnering that wisdom, whatever it is, and it's just, you know, a cup of coffee and not very valuable, then what ends up happening is they don't come back. Value is about opportunities to influence and engage. And if you don't provide that, if they don't feel that, then they aren't coming back. 
underneath that, you need to be open about what recognition might be available. And again, it doesn't have to be their names and lights. How do you make them feel valuable? Do they Is the recognition internally just by the people in the room and they feel really good about, as the chancellor did with the kitchen cabinet, of those 11, 12, 13 people? They didn't need recognition. What their recognition was looking across the table that I'm at the table with the key people in this city, in Omaha. That was enough. And then maybe an appropriate appreciation, the holidays, personal note, things of that nature. This does not have to be, well, we're going to name buildings after this group or individuals in the group. Recognition is more subtle, but more important. Also, they have to be, you have to give them opportunity to have input. So a structured meeting is important. How do you get all of them to feel as if their input has value? And it's also somewhat exclusive. They want to feel like the people in the room are almost above them, even though if you actually did this correctly and they all felt that way, they're all at the same level. But you want them to think about it from the perspective of, I'm in a room with the the creme de la creme of this particular area, whatever that is. Maybe it's a whole bunch of patients who have been through a very similar healthcare series of experiences, and they're like, wow, these people are really cool because they've been treated by the same one. There has to be an elevation of exclusivity. This is a special group. The last thing is you got to give them a little bit of opportunity to network and collaborate informally. If it's all business, it doesn't work. You have to give them a sense that there's an opportunity for them to socially connect in a meaningful way. That could be 15 minutes before the meeting starts with a cup of coffee where they're talking about their families or their businesses or whatever. But always realize that there's a social part of this that goes well beyond the organization. It's about their connection to each other and to the organization through the mission or whatever it is that they represent. So the two big takeaways from the organizational perspective, you have to be willing to listen. You have to be willing to accept some of the thoughts that they have. If you're not, don't do this. And number two, from the members or the donors, philanthropists, you know, whomever they are, you have to make sure they feel this is valuable. And then the sub points that came from that that I mentioned. Advisory groups can be helpful on lots of different fronts, but if they're mismanaged and misrun with misguided sense of their, their obligations and or their intent or their value, you will actually cause yourself damage. So this becomes a more valuable risk reward. The reward can be great. The risk can be moderated. But if you mess it up, the risk gets a lot higher because they're out there telling people, yeah, they really don't care about the community. They don't want to listen. You don't want that. You want them saying just the opposite. This is an organization that wants the community to be highly engaged to solve your particular problem that you serve. Advisory groups, formally or informally, can greatly help you with that if you handle them in the right way. Don't forget to check out the blogs at Hallett Philanthropy. Two a week or so, things that I see, read, think about, witness, just something to give you an opportunity. 90 seconds, that's all they are. Give you a chance to think. Push maybe a thought through your head to go, wow, I hadn't thought about that. That's their goal. HallettPhilanthropy.com. Get an RSS feed right to you if you want. Or you can communicate with me directly at podcast at HallettPhilanthropy.com. We move into December. Year end as this is being recorded. And it's a powerful time of the year to realize and recognize how important nonprofit work is. I've, I say this more and more often, and particularly with planning and strategy and things that I do with clients, that philanthropy sits between free enterprise where for-profit business doesn't see what is needing to be done as profitable, so they don't do it, and government, which is kind of inefficient and ineffective at times. Philanthropy, nonprofits sit between the two to solve community problems. What you're doing every day, no matter where you are, what you're doing, who you represent, what mission you're serving, you are someone in that hole that's helping your community to be a better place, to help people in need, and that's powerful. I hope you feel that, that there's value in what you do. Don't forget, we're a world made up of three groups of people, my all-time favorite, favorite saying. Some people make things happen, some people watch things happen, and there are those who wondered what happened. You are someone who's making something happen. As you look at what you do, I hope you have a chance every day to realize that you're important to your community and to those that you serve. 
And in doing so, you're changing the world. Philanthropy doesn't mean money. It means love of mankind, love of humankind. And you are one of the soldiers that's trying to accomplish just that. I'll look forward to seeing you the next time right back here on the next edition of Around with Randall. And don't forget, make it a great day. Thank you.